to this Welcome panel, to this uh, which is called Contemporary Art Futures, Redefining the Role of um, Applied Arts Museums. And I've also added a, another little title to it, which is um, a kind of a, a, a sort of tag for it, Art Futures Applied. Um, this particular panel uh, came about, um, actually what I should do is first introduce myself, isn't it? Otherwise, you have no idea who I am. My name is Julian Robson. I'm a, an independent curator. Um, I've, uh, I, I currently work in the United States with collectors, um, but have been uh, a museum curator in the United States at the Speed Art Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, and also at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. During the 1990s, I worked here in Vienna um, with uh, art galleries, with commercial art galleries, and previous to that, I worked in the university system in the United Kingdom um, in art galleries and universities. Um, I was asked to put together this panel and it seemed very appropriate given that we have a group who have come from the United States who are connected to a museum in Louisville, Kentucky called KMAC, which stands for the Kentucky Museum of Art and Crafts, uh, that we perhaps should address some of the issues that I had been in discussion with the director of that museum in, in the recent past, and also something that had constituted some of the discussions that I had had with Dr. Thun Hohenstein uh, when I'd visited him once or twice for coffee at the, the MAC in Vienna. Um, primarily, this is a, a, a panel that's about uh, the way that the boundaries um, of art practices have become porous and how are we to address that. It might seem funny to have a, a discussion about museums at an art fair, but I think that it's important uh, because uh, museums themselves are not just the repositories of an art history that has passed, they also actively are part of the mechanism uh, that helps develop and change uh, the way that we think about art and how collectors themselves actually go about collecting things. Um, to come back to the subject, um, the presumed boundaries that exist between what we call the fine arts and what we've been calling uh, the applied arts seem to have started to break down. And there certainly has been in the last few years a, a series of shows um, or, or an interest from curators in creating exhibitions that do uh, somehow consider different disciplines um, and how they are porous and how they kind of flow into each other. I think that the 2013 Venice Biennale, which was curated by um, Massimiliano Gioni, um, is a great example. It's kind of like a beacon, really, of something that was already going on, uh, of beginning to look at how, when we think about the visual arts, we actually think about the world that artists occupy rather than a set of di divided categories that have a hierarchy. And I think we, modernism perhaps left us with a sense that there was a hierarchy where what we would call the fine arts were on the top of that and then everything else went down from there. And the notion of craft in particular um, sort of was seen much more in a kind of artisanal way um, than as being something that was essential to the arts. Um, so what I wanted to do was to think about how this porosity um, sort of it happens in both ideas, in forms, materials, across disciplines in, in the visual arts. Um, and then what I wanted to go on to say was that what, while this dialogue between art and craft is, it's not itself new, it, there's a kind of increasing interplay between artistic practices that I see as offering up a series of questions that are the questions that I really want to address to these two gentlemen. Um, and I'll put them first together and then we'll come to them one by one and they can answer in the way that they, they feel is appropriate. But first of all, what is the role of a museum of applied or craft arts in this new environment, in this environment where we're changing our sense of how disciplines interlock with each other? Um, can this, secondly, can this blurring of categories be employed to formulate new discussions about the function of decoration um, and craft in art? And then finally, can this 
Uh, th and this is quite appropriate to the way that museums are coming under a lot of pressure to actually deal with audiences, and this is particularly appropriate when talking to an Austrian museum director because there are American models that are beginning to infiltrate uh, the Austrian model of museums. Uh, can, this ca can this strategy um, of dealing with this uh, porosity uh, develop new audiences? The, the two uh, speakers we have today are, first of all, Aldi Milliken, who is on my left, and then Dr. Thun Hornstein, who is the director of the MAC, the Museum für Angewandte Kunst, the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna. Um, Aldi Milliken uh, came to Louisville, Kentucky from Sweden. He's been the uh, executive director and uh, chief curator of the Kentucky Museum of Art and Craft, KMAC, um, since 2012. Um, he's also an adjunct professor at the University of Louisville, which is a role that comes with this director job. He completed uh, a degree in studio art at Lewis and Clark College in, in Portland, Oregon in 1989, and also took a teaching certificate. So from 1993 to 97, he taught at Jakarta International School, Indonesia, and then the American International School in Budapest, before he joined a gallery called Zinc Gallery in Stockholm as its director. In 2003, he founded Millikan Gallery in Stockholm, uh, where he ran an international program of exhibitions. Um, and he continued this until 2012, when he was invited to join KMAC. Um, the city of Louisville was very lucky to, to get him. Um, and uh, he was, whilst in Stockholm, he was a founding member of, uh, is this Stockholm, Stockholm, Stockholm? Yep, um, as, which is a Swedish cultural awareness organization. And from 2003 to 2009, he was a board member of the Swedish Gallery Association in Stockholm. He's curated numerous exhibitions in his various positions, as well as being involved in numerous cultural initiatives in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I have one quote from him, which I think is a useful one to, to throw into this arena, um, which perhaps uh, points to the way that he's rethinking uh, the way that KMAC should actually develop its program. And he says, the museum explores the relationship between art and craft by identifying art as big ideas and craft as the intersection between process, materials, and labor. Our goal is to educate and inspire while promoting a better understanding of art and craft through exhibitions, collaborations, outreach, and the permanent collection. So that's Aldi Milliken. And then I come to our second speaker is uh, Dr. Thunhorn, Christoph Thunhornstein, who's the director of the MAC in, in Vienna. Um, Christoph was, uh, he, he took over the directorship of the MAC in 2011. So he's now been there for more than, four, well, almost four years, isn't it? Um, and uh, his background is that he completed a doctoral degree in law in 1982 and, and, and a degree in political science and art history in 1983 at the University of Vienna. Um, and in 1984, he began to work for the Austrian Foreign Ministry and had a number of posts uh, that they sent him. Uh, from 1999 to 2007, and this was actually the period when I first met him, when I was a curator, he was director of the Austrian Cultural Forum in New York um, and actually oversaw the opening of the new building in New York that was designed by Raimund Abrams, uh, which opened in 2002. Um, following that, he became the director of uh, Departure, which is the creative agency of the city of Vienna, uh, a position he held until August 2011. He's published on many topics dealing above all with European integration and with contemporary culture and art, and has held numerous lectures on these topics. He's also curated exhibitions of contemporary art, and he, he regularly serves on selection juries. I have also a nice little quote from him that I found, um, where he says that uh, applied art needs to be filled with new life utilizing its potential as a motor of positive change in our society, socially, ecologically, and culturally, is the main mission of an active museum of applied arts. 
So I want to come back to these questions that are at the beginning of this uh, talk. And what I'm going to do is, first of all, hand over to Aldi Milliken. I don't think the Mac needs a lot of introduction here to this audience. Um, but uh, KMAC obviously does, as nobody, well, there's 12 people here who have been there. Um, and uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Aldi and, and again throw at you these first two questions. What is the role of a museum of applied arts in this new environment? And can the blurring of categories be employed to formulate a new discussion about function, decoration, and craft in art? Thank, thank you, Julie. And, um... And, and thank you all for, for, for being here today. Um, and thank you to Vienna Kemp Contemporary for, for hosting this, uh, this interesting discussion. I thought I'd start by showing some slides or some pictures of, of our program, uh, especially for the, the Viennese public who have never uh, ventured to, uh, to, to Louisville. And hopefully uh, this would be a, 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 an incentive or enticing, enticement for, for you all to come. Uh, if I could just have the first slide. Um, uh, as Julian said, I started in 2012, uh, uh, having come from, from Stockholm. And uh, unfortunately, when I arrived, there wasn't much of a program that had been planned. Uh, one of the things that had planned was, a, was an NEA-funded exhibition of uh, con a survey of contemporary uh, ca uh, Caribbean art. Uh, I had never been to the to the Caribbean in any meaningful way. So it was, it, it was very problematic for me to, to actually uh, stand in front of an exhibition that I didn't really feel proud of or feel that I knew that much about. Uh, and so uh, what, one of the, the strategies that I used, and one of the things that's really, I think, held with us uh, for, for, uh, for, um, uh, to date, was, was bringing in as many artists into the, uh, into the, dis into the dialogue or into the um, this is just flipping through, I don't know, um, uh, was, was to bring as many artists into the dialogue as possible. So this first exhibition called Into the Mix was, was um, uh, really in collaboration with artists from the, from the, from the, from the Caribbean region. And one, one of the things that I wanted to express when, um, uh, also when I got to, to, to the museum was um, that the museum should not be precious. That, that I should, we should be able to um, activate the museum starting from the outside. Uh, so this is a, a work by Sophie Malnaldo. Uh, uh, she's, a, she's an artist based in New York, um, and, uh, but um, uh, from Puerto, from also, uh, also living in Puerto Rico. And, and so she, uh, started, she started this, uh, this work uh, by uh, wanting to, to really activate the street. Um, I just, yeah, it's, it's just slipping through. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's uh, moving faster than I'm ready for. Yeah, yeah. It shouldn't be automatic. See, I'm not touching it. Um, in any case, I'll speak faster, and maybe that'll, you know, <laughs> my portion will be better. Um, so I, we really wanted to activate the street. I, I, again, I think what, it, what is uh, interesting to note with, with the city of Louisville is it's much, it's, it's much like many Midwestern cities where the downtown is... Uh, is not as populated as, as, as European cities. And I think it's very important to note. One of the things that we really have to do in, in our museum culture in our city is bring people to the downtown area. Most people live on the, on the surrounding outskirts uh, of the city and, and everyone has to uh, come to the, to the downtown by car. And so I was really thinking about how we can activate the street and sort of rethinking our relationship to the city. Uh, and so Sophia's work, and you can see it in the background of that, of, of that little small slide there, um, was really uh, uh, sort of intentional. And the, uh, the other thing that, that uh, was interesting with Louisville was uh, it's a city that was in its prime in the 1880s. Uh, it, was, it was, well, I mean, it, to, to some extent. And, um, uh, and so I think we, uh, uh, I wanted to respond to the buildings and the architecture of that, of that, of that time. Uh, the, um, the next slide, when we, get it, when we get it there, is a work by Christopher Cozier um, and Ebony Patterson. And Christopher uh, has made uh, small prints uh, and um, made an installation of small prints. Uh, and um, his, his parents were bureaucrats in the, in the Trinidadian system. And, and um, uh, I felt like printmaking, a conversation with printmaking, 
uh, was, was sort of relevant to this first exhibition. And then Ebony Patterson uses uh, textile work uh, to, uh, in a contemporary setting, in a contemporary way, she actually took her, um, uh, he made, she made her, her pieces uh, by sending them to Walmart and then embellishing them and, um, and adding to, to textiles. And, certainly, and textiles is something that we, we talk a lot about uh, in sort of in the, in the art and craft world of the United States. The, the, the third slide from that, from that, uh, uh, from that show was Christopher Co Cozier's uh, muscle car. It was a sound installation. Uh, we parked it out front, and um, uh, he, uh, he wanted to make a sound piece. And so again, we activated a, 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 a strata that had never been to the museum before. We really wanted to reach out to, to uh, mechanics, to, to people that uh, were making very finely tuned, uh, tuned cars. Uh, I've got no idea what the next slide is. Um, no, the next slide um, is, um, we, we can just run it through, actually, it doesn't matter, we just, we just go through. Um, the next slide is, uh, comes a little bit later in the, um, uh, in our sort of, in our program, which is um, uh, an exhibition called uh, The Ritual, uh, the, ritual and is the Ritual and Residue, The Art of Drink. And we started to want to think about how um, prac, uh, how uh, how um, formal uh, how formal ideas, something that we did every day, sort of was manifested into things that we uh, uh, how formal how form manifested into things that we did every day. So the art of drink um, was it, again a collaboration with with uh, with with. Um, with artists and with the public. It was a very socially motivated exhibition. Uh, the, first, uh, the first work was by Tom Marioni, who's made the act of drinking beer uh, is the highest form of art. And it was done in the 1970s. And it's a, it is a very interesting um, conceptual piece uh, that engages artists in the community. Uh, and then also is something that is a performance that Tom Marioni does um, uh, in, in a way that, in, in a way that he, he activates, uh, which you can see here. So you need to cut me off soon, um, and then and then um, dotted throughout the the exhibition were vessels and forms. Dante Marioni um, uh, of uh, a glass blower. Um, this piece by Peter um, Spenger um, uh, uh, also uh, was uh, was something that we loaned. Uh, and then this work right here by Matt Cummings, who's a local glass artist, um, and he created a, a whole series of vessels called the Potentious Beer Company. Um, uh, and it was uh, a, a way, he wanted to develop a system in which we could experience beer. Uh, and this is the artist uh, talking about, his, about his pieces. And you can see on the, t on the, on the, table, on the table there, there are different uh, beer glasses and different types of beer. Uh, and then the public experiences the beer. So obviously one of the ways in which we're attracting our public is to uh, find activities that uh, connect us and are common for all of us. Uh, also, if part of that exhibition was a, a high tea ceremony. Um, and this is embedded inside the show. Um, so there are works, um, Paul Valesky and other works around, around the audience. Um, so in this particular slide, we have an associate or a, a, a intern curator talking about the exhibition to the people who are engaged in the high tea. This, this exhibition um, was our, our white glove test or a punk poster show. We collaborated with uh, the, uh, a, a music curator uh, who developed an exhibition called the white glove test. And what was interesting about this exhibition was it was really a history of printmaking from 1970 to 1990, 1996, which were really important years for the development of printing. You have hands, handmade posters uh, all the way on the right. Uh, then we um, evolved into um, uh, more sophisticated printing, um, people, uh, artists hanging out at Kinko's, and then of course desktop publishing. So embedded inside a punk poster show was, um, uh, or uh, embedded in the music industry was also this sort of survey of print media for the last 20 years. Uh, and what was interesting was that what, 
uh, it, it was one of our most popular exhibitions, and we had all of these people coming in coat and ties, standing by their, themselves when they were in high school and going to punk concerts. It was a really quite, quite an extraordinary show. This was a, an exhibition uh, curated with Joey Yates, our associate curator who's here tonight. Um, this was uh, an exhibition with Simone Lee, who was uh, trained as a, as a, as a ceramicist, uh, and then really evolved or merged into the, to the contemporary art world. And um, uh, this, particular, uh, this particular show, I wanted to show this, this exhibition to you all because we produced three or four works for this exhibition. And I think that was one of the things that, are, that is unique for our museum is that we really try to work with, 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 with artists to produce works for our shows. Uh, and also we want to use local artisans whenever possible. Uh, so. The, uh, the totem was made by a local, a local artist, and then the, the glass panel actually was the artist, um, a church from, that the artist um, actually grew up in. And here's another view. Uh, Kentucky is known for tobacco. It used to be the t tobacco center of the, of the world. Uh, and so the, uh, the tent in the background is, was made by a local uh, farmer who, who wound the, what they call hands of tobacco. And, and that is actually a very uh, complicated uh, process. It's a, very, uh, it's a very rigorous process of drying the tobacco. And so we had a, lot of, we had a hard time finding uh, the, uh, someone who could make, uh, make these hands of tobacco then for, for this exhibition. And we had to spray the tobacco every day to keep it, um, to keep it fresh. Uh, now this is the last this is the last exhibition I'm going to show you. It's an exhibition that I curated this last year called Food, Shelter, Clothing. Uh, this is a work by Kenyatta Hinkle, uh, who um, uh, actually uh, made her own museum, was, uh, uh, was a, a, the director of her, her own museum, and was an artist in her own museum. And this was really a negotiation that I went through with this artist. She's African-American, and obviously um, I wanted to, uh, we wanted to have a discussion about perspectives uh, curatorial perspectives in the, in the exhibition, and certainly uh, both being a, fee, uh, a woman and being African American and not being represented in museums, uh, I think is something that uh, American museums really need to think about. And um, this, this, um, uh, I wanted this exhibition to start with this piece so that our public would understand that um, I had my own curatorial position and that they should challenge that curatorial position. Um, this is um, further into the exhibition, um, again on the first floor. And, and then this is, I think, sort of uh, irrelevant for, for, for today's discussion. Um, there is a barrel maker on the far left. Um, uh, so this is, this is a workshop with a, with a barrel maker. Uh, it's a very traditional practice in, um, uh, in Kentucky, uh, in the Midwest. And then the, the, the woman on the right is actually making kombucha. And um, uh, because the, the show was uh, about food, sheltering, and clothing, I wanted to look at other, other alternative forms of how people conserve food, how people um, are thinking about um, uh, uh, different types of food. Uh, and so we, embedded inside the exhibition, uh, I wanted to activate the space uh, with other forms, with other traditional craft-making practice. Uh, this is a work by Ming Wei Li. Um, he's a Taiwanese artist. Uh, this is called the Mending Project, and I think this also is something that's, that represents the relationship between art and craft that we're really trying to explore in the museum. Uh, this work is activated by a mender, someone that mends clothing. Uh, that clothing uh, is brought to the museum by our public, and so there's a really interesting dialogue between our public and, and also uh, a volunteer or, or someone who activates this particular work. In America, uh, people generally think of sewing as a, as a craft. Um, in this particular piece, the, the art is really the exchange between two people, and then the craft allows or enables uh, the, um, the, the art to, to happen. The article of clothing is, is left uh, to um, on the on the table and then um, and then brought and then it picked up at the at the end of the exhibition. The 
last two pieces, I wanted to just talk really quickly about folk art. Uh, we are a, a region that is extraordinary folk art uh, artists, and this is sort of my reminder that I need to tell you about, uh, uh, at least uh, I think acknowledge that folk art is interesting in the context of our museum. Uh, and then um, uh, that maybe a folk artist is sort of an outsider artist. And, and then also this is a contemporary artist, um, uh, Tamika Norris, who is also in a sense an, as an outsider, as I, as I explained maybe in an earlier piece. I also talk about video work as, um, as a material that needs to be uh, constructed and, and put together uh, much, as a materi uh, much as a material of uh, a piece of ceramic or, or whatnot. The last piece, or second to last piece, um, if Julian allows it, is, um, is in this particular exhibition, we had an artist living in the museum uh, for three months. And, and that was important for me to, to, um, uh, to do. Uh, it was kind of like a Soho apartment. She the artist found it was, it was a pretty amazing space. But it was also uh, a way for us to, to, uh, to look at artistic practice. The space changed every, every day. Uh, this was the neatest that it, it, it ever was. Um, what was also interesting about this particular uh, artist was that she introduced us to other craft practice, whittling, um, sewing, um, and other things that, and other artists that were, I think, that needed to be incorporated into the, into the museum. Here's some uh, of our public engaging or activating the, the space and looking at the artist research. Um, uh, and then uh, this is what it looked like, uh, you know, after a Saturday. It's, it obviously was a, was, um, a mess, uh, um, but... Uh, something that was very much alive, very much changed every day, uh, something that really activated our public, and, and it became a thing. People, people really started to come to the museum just to hang out with the, with the, with the artist. Um, uh, and so she developed her own following inside, embedded into our exhibition program. Um, one thing I want to say quickly that I forgot to mention at the beginning is that there will actually be a guided tour leaving here for those of you who wish to go on a guided tour of the art fair that will leave here when this talk is finished. So um, I just forgot to mention that at the beginning. But it, it, Can I show one more slide? <laughs> <laughs> this is it, also a part of Food Shelter Clothing was this, was this, was this um, grain pit. This is, a, this is an economic exchange um, area that was placed in a local bank. Uh, as uh, obviously food and economy is something that was really is, is sort of really important for us uh, to, to think about and um, so this banks are changing banks have, have spaces that are empty and so we um, we found ways to activate the bank during normal operating hours and so people could come and sit on the grain pit they could uh, we could have uh, programming on the grain pit uh, here we are trading bread um, for work uh, and um, so we had another local artist uh, uh, make bread as a currency and then, um, and then uh, trade it uh, for, um, for other types of activities. Thank I'm you. sorry I interrupted you then. You took a breath. Yes. <laughs> sorry that was um, so fast. Before I hand over to Christoph, I just want to bring up one point, and that is that it, it's interesting to think about this notion of the porosity of artistic practice in relation to two museums that are situated in cities in different parts of the world that are of a different scale, one of which obviously has a long history. The MAC is 150 years old. KMAC is 30 years old. And I think, as you can see from all these slides, that KMAC is, um, in relation to the MAC, is a small institution. Um, but I think what, what's important to both institutions is, is given that they exist within particular types of communities is also how do they relate to those communities and it's clear that what you're trying to do is also to expand on the notion of how this can be relevant to your particular community and this is something that you have talked to me uh, in a roundabout way about the MAC as well but let me throw that question at you again and, and given the, the sense of porosity and in artistic practice and the relationship of um, the decorative and the practical arts to, and the applied arts to the, what we used to call the fine arts. And um, what do you see as the role of the Museum of Applied Arts in this new environment? And can this blurring of categories be employed to formulate new discussions about function, decoration, and craft in art? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Sorry about this. Uh kind of uh, peculiar state of my voice. 
It's the reason I've been doing and doing and doing. Uh, no, but it's okay. Um, I would like to uh, kind of connect also what you said, and I was grateful um, that uh, I don't have to talk so much. Yeah. Um, but I can't compete with uh, the visual power of slides, obviously. Um, for me, it was interesting to see, since I followed the uh, New York Museum of Arts and Craft also and what they are doing and how you define what you're doing, I mean, to, to judge from uh, the slides we have seen. Um, I mean, we are going obviously in a very diff different direction, though um, at certain points you also start to ask questions. For instance, we are preparing a big exhibition about craft today, yeah? We call it Handwerk in German. Um, and of course, uh, this raises uh, or causes a lot of discussion uh, about whether we should be doing such an exhibition at all, because the museum was uh, about decorative arts, is about decorative arts. By the way, uh, we had discussions also about changing the name, especially suggestions from outside the museum to kind of uh, uh, call it Museum of Decorative Arts, or s others uh, said Museum, uh, Design Museum, we resisted. We don't think it's appropriate for the MAC, so we stay with the title uh, Museum of uh, Applied Arts, uh, Contemporary Art. So we are a museum that also deals with contemporary fine art. Uh, but of course we have a huge collection of uh, applied arts um, f covering many, spanning many centuries. Uh, for us, um, several uh, points are, I think, important. On the one hand, um, what is our relevance in the state of society today? Yeah? This was very much also a driving force at, uh, when we were um, founded uh, more than 150 years ago. So the museum always had, I mean, there were periods when it was of uh, less importance to some directors, and, and for others it was more important. For me, it's very important. So definitely you have to deal with society today because we are dealing with applied arts. Applied arts are arts that are supposed to be useful, that uh, are supposed to provide concrete solutions, be it design, architecture, other fields of applied arts. And uh, so therefore it's I think absolutely necessary to always touch base with what's going on around you and even, and this is also I guess a new development, um, to redefine a museum more and more also as a laboratory for the future. Um, but we are at the same time a museum, why? Because we have a huge collection of almost 600,000 objects um, and we have to show as much as possible uh, of the collection, it's a few percent, it's a small percentage anyway, but that's the problem of any uh, major museum. But we have to work with the collection. And the obvious solution to that problem is that you try to kind of uh, construct a relationship between uh, your collections, what you can kind of learn uh, from uh, objects of uh, earlier centuries, uh, in particular, Vienna 1900, we can uh, still learn a lot from Vienna 1900, but also from other periods in time, and, um, and uh, deal with the contemporary on, that, on the other hand. Yeah? And what's also interesting is that last year when we opened the Mark Design Lab, we had an, a very long discussion preceding that uh, particular major project, the anniversary project of 150 years um, of how, first of all, to define design. The usual notion of design starts somewhere in the early 20th century, and of course today it's a, a term used a lot and also misused a lot. Uh, but we said, and in, in keeping also with new developments internationally, we said also a kind of uh, craft uh, object from China of the 7th, 16th century is design in a way, why not, yeah? And this is a new school of uh, defining design, design that's really um, getting more and more influential and for our Mark Design Lab it was very clear that was the term we want to stick to and uh, we have been working uh, with ever since and I think it was a good decision uh, because uh, all the other boundaries are very, um, how should I say, um, 
um, you you take those boundaries, uh, but uh, you could also define it completely different. And now, and that's my last sentence, um, you have new developments because some people said design is really when you do a, a, a series of objects, high number of objects, industrially produced or manufactured um, at um, hopefully low price so everybody can buy it. Uh, nowadays you have completely new developments. On the one hand, you have design pretending to be art uh, with limited editions, high prices. I'm not so happy about this development. I think it's the wrong direction. Uh, but you also have other developments with kind of the serial object um, doesn't play that much of a role anymore because 3D printing and other techniques allow you to do tailor-made design objects just for one person, but at a low cost. So there are all sorts of developments, and these obviously lead to uh, kind of not drawing too severe uh, distinctions that are too severe. You look like you want to say something. Sorry? You look like you want to say I was, yeah, I was, I was actually going to, I mean, I can't comment a little bit. I, um, uh, we also actually, just to, uh, in a similar sense, uh, went have been under pressure to uh, to change our our name. Uh, it seems like every few months someone comes up with uh, with a great idea, and that that was that was one of them. I've 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 also uh, been extremely reluctant even to think about that, mostly because I think, uh, at least in the United States, craft. We use craft more than applied arts. Craft is is something that artists are really embracing, um, and and owning, and 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 so it's. It's been sort of a you know if you put it in the if you put it in the closet long enough it'll be it'll be um, it'll be trendy again, um, and one of the things that really impressed me what was what you all were doing at the at the Mac was the the um, the the not only the amount of people that were in, in, uh, really enjoying the museum uh, and you have so many areas for people just to hang out just to be around um, the art and the and the exhibitions were so creatively installed that there were the works became alive i mean they were there was really i mean the flying uh, 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 textiles i mean is a, is a, is a brilliant uh, i think um, display one of the things that 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 you mentioned when when we were talking before was about a, about a certain hierarchy and i'm um, wanting to balance a hierarchy and i wonder if maybe that's a slight difference between us is that we're trying to not we're trying to ignore that a hierarchy exists somehow. It it because uh, we we're trying to place. Uh, uh, we don't have maybe the historical um, uh, work that we have to to bring forward, but we're also maybe not trying to to be hierarchical. We're trying to actually um, uh, have have artists take uh, uh, traditional practices or even traditional forms. And then bring them into um, a, a sort of a new dialogue or a new conversation. Let's be very outspoken, especially uh, in this context of an art fair. I mean, we don't. I'm, I'm, we are trying to wipe out any hierarchy. Yeah, uh, but the craft issue, where you actually have a museum uh, exhibition spaces, people working on objects uh, and kind of bringing them really as active participants is something different to what the museum has done uh, in the past in, in its main exhibition halls. I mean, we've had an exhibition recently about that, but it goes another step into this direction. But what we are trying to um, uh, not to uh, pursue is this old idea that free fine art is the higher art and the applied arts, the decorative arts, are the lower arts because they have to be useful, they have to be concrete, they have to come up with uh, uh, concrete solutions. I don't think that works at all, and um, we, we talked about that before, but it's really the credo of the Vienna Secession that uh, the arts have equal rank and need to inspire each other, and to be frank, we have such pressure today, especially also in contemporary fine art, on artists to produce artwork for biennials, for art fairs, etc., uh, etc., et that inspiration for those artists is really hard to get, you know, anymore. So I think there is a very strong case, also here talking 
in the midst of an art fair of um, fine art having a much higher respect and greater interest in the applied arts and vice versa, of course, uh, because there's a lot of inspiration to be had also um, on the part of uh, fine artists from the applied arts. So, so you're, you're, st you're still saying that there are these divisions, but that they actually happen on the same level, you know, um, are, rather than the one divisions of, being One of the hierarchy. most wonderful experiences for me is when we um, redid Vienna 1900, uh, our permanent spaces. Uh, I think they're really beautifully done. Um, and then, or also the design lab, and then fine artists come to me, especially as a younger generation artist, and say, it's outstanding. I didn't know that such a wealth, that such uh, of objects exist. I'm, I'm taking a lot of inspiration from these. Yeah? This is something that's overwhelming. Right, and so, so there is also a kind of integration happening in the museum where um, you know, you've had fine artists coming in and working with the collection to make their Which exhibitions. Which was great. And, My predecessor, yeah. Peter Nova, that was his revolutionary um, undertaking, was really uh, to kind of reawake um, an applied art museum by inviting major, especially fine artists, uh, to uh, um, um, develop uh, permanent exhibition rooms uh, for the applied arts. Yeah, I, I think the, the um, I feel like at least in the United States, there's so many disenfranchised artists that they're really coming back to craft to subvert the art market. And, and so that's one of the things I think we're finding sort of interesting. Um, uh, there's also DIY movement. And, and so I think one of the things that we're trying to position the museum as is trying to uh, at least honor or balance uh, non-university trained artists, for instance, um, uh, so that uh, uh, we're valuing their work uh, uh, as much as, as uh, a university, or not even, not even sort of maybe not even separating them as two diff in two different categories. Um, that, and that's where we're sort of alluding to with folk artists. But we, I, again, in, in, in our area, the, the school system does not dictate who is a successful artist or not. And so um, we have to really be attuned to uh, artists working in all different genres and all different ideas. So we can actually put a teapot as a sculpture next to um, a fine art sculpture and not even say that they're one or the other somehow. I think it's great. And I think uh, we should encourage also artists, and it's always vice versa, uh, to take a much greater interest uh, in what's going in the newest developments in other disciplines, you know? Because artists uh, have a very selective interest. For instance, a lot of artists are interested in international style architecture. Yeah? But there's very little interest in the newest developments of architecture that uh, in many cases doesn't involve building at all, but for instance, uh, devising uh, tactical urbanisms or whatever. Yeah? Or there's very little interest in the newest developments in design, um, which doesn't in, uh, imply to a large extent uh, kind of um, uh, designing objects, but designing strategies, uh, designing uh, apps, etc. And there is not enough interest in that. So it's also an, a kind of old-fashioned notion of design that many artists are, interest, uh, are interested in, exhibitions proving the rule, as always. Yeah. Do, do you think then, I mean, both of you, do you think then that a museum can also be a kind of catalyst for artists to, to kind of open up the way they think also? You've, you've pointed to... People, you know, Peter Nova's uh, bringing artists in to actually work with the collection and so on. And, and we had a uh, personally a kind of encounter with that with a young artist we visited the other day who talked about she'd been asked to do a show at the Mac and she was busy doing her things. And then in discussions with the curator, she discovered that really she wanted to kind of learn about the collection and to engage with the collection. And do you, do you see that as a, a, a kind of vital way of helping artistic practice develop? It's absolutely necessary, you know. And I have been kind of frustrated in the last couple of years. And one of the um, reasons, motives for me also to initiate the Biennale in Vienna, which is the world's first one to combine art, architecture and design, is exactly 
uh, to commission exhibitions that show the latest thinking, uh, especially in the disciplines of design and architecture, and, uh, but add uh, major art shows to it so that uh, people really are encouraged to come and look and then also look, have a look at the other exhibitions they would normally not see. And it's, uh, I think it's a process that's absolutely necessary. I'm, I'm not fond of merging the, the disciplines because the mechanisms of the disciplines are completely different. The art market has a completely different mechanism or several than uh, the new design market, so to speak, yeah, especially the avant-garde design uh, sphere. And the same goes for architecture. Uh, and we, we need a more and more holistic view uh, for everything, but it's fascinating to kind of bring these disciplines together. And it's our role also to do it, definitely. But also vice versa, I think that uh, architects and designers uh, are extremely well advised uh, to have a look uh, what's going on in fine art currently. Yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think that we, um, uh, uh, we are a smaller museum, so we don't have uh, departmental specific specificity, specificities. So uh, our departments or our staff is um, is looking uh, very much cross disciplinary. So we actually, and I'm not sure that I, even if we had a staff of 100 and 150 um, as you do, that we would that at least we would try to. Um, uh, push for cross-disciplinary -discipl uh, uh, sort of activities. And I know that you've done this a little bit with, your, with, with, with what you're doing um, in talking with your, with your curators. Well, one of the things that, that I initiated when we, when we came to the museum was to bring the education department and the curatorial department and, and really have them sit on the same floor so that they're, they're going through uh, exhibitions uh, together and planning exhibitions together so there's not just a, a curatorial content but also uh, how one, uh, how we uh, get our message out into our public. No, I definitely agree. And uh, what I said, uh, and you said, for, for artists, uh, um, also uh, is definitely true for curators, for museum directors, etc. I think it's very important to keep abreast of developments in all the disciplines, including other disciplines uh, we haven't mentioned yet, yeah? uh, as well as technological uh, progress and so on and so forth which leads me, of course, to the basic um, issue we are currently also dealing with, which is uh, raise, kind of draw the attention to the fact that we live in a new modernity. Um, to, to, uh, we're sort of going to come to a close in a minute, and, and I'll open up in case there's anybody has any questions. But just to come back to what I was saying at the beginning, and, and you might even have a yes or no answer for this. Um, but the, I guess the question is that, given that you both are dealing with localities, but those localities are really quite different from each other, um, you have different audiences and different audience needs, um, which are determined by being in a big city and being a national institution, and uh, you being in a, a smaller city and uh, being a, a, a small collection, whilst yours is a very large collection, you're a big institution, you're a small institution, so on. Um, given these uh, approaches that you've both been describing, um, and the pressures that you come under in terms of audience development and the need to get people through the door, um, do you see these strategies of thinking about this uh, porosity and, and the need to uh, create a kind of interdisciplinary engagement, which doesn't necessarily mean things just blending into each other, but that interdisciplinary engagement. Could, do you see that as a strategy for developing new audiences and, and other particular things that you would say that are, are applicable to that? Um, maybe problems that it, that it brings forward or, or, uh, or very positive things that it achieves? Basically, there are two ways to go about it. One is to program blockbusters and hope that the people uh, really come uh, and consider the blockbuster. Yeah, But I think that's not right to do all the time. Occasionally, of course, it's okay if the topic is right for the museum. Um, I think it's much more important uh, in terms of learning 
um, to really broaden your programs in a way that you reach uh, out to a much la larger audience. And this audience development is extremely difficult. Yeah? So I'm, uh, we are working on it. Um, uh, but I can tell you that in Vienna, I guess that 85 to 90 percent of museum visitors in Vienna have academic degrees. And that gives you a really kind of cool picture how much we have to do. And I'm not, it's probably a little bit different in the US, but still the, the percentage of people with academic degrees is um, much too high. I'm saying we need all those, but we need in addition a much larger percentage um, of people from somewhere, I don't know, police people, uh, fire department people, and so on and so forth. And we have to work on that, especially as a Museum of Applied Arts, uh, doing things that are very close uh, to what uh, people's, uh, what the life of those people is. Yeah, yeah and I think that we're, we're doing something that, yeah, along the, those same lines where, where we need to initiate collaborations. Uh, and so we use the, the everyday object to infiltrate um, the bank, um, other institutions, uh, Metro Hall, uh, uh, people's homes, uh, and so we're almost initiating pop-ups that are, that are broader or extend outside of our physical space. Uh, and and uh, partly because of uh, the fact that we are a very small institution and, the, and that we're, uh, we want to be or, or uh, we are a ambitious and we know that we need to reach more people, we have to use whatever resource we can to, to, to uh, have a strong foundation, but then also get out into the community as much as possible. And I think that's one of the things that's happening in culture in the, in the United States is that's now an expectation. Uh, we've got a new director of, uh, of the new conductor for the symphony. He's playing on the street in Louisville. Um, he's doing shows, road shows, if, almost, if you will. And so culture is, is, I think, not is expected to not be static uh, and to be something that that uh, really uh, initiates. People to bring them in to the to the to the doors of the of the, of the institution, and that's something that's really changed quite a bit um, uh, for us as well. Well, I'd like to thank you both for participating in this panel. Now, I want to open up to the audience just for a couple of minutes in case there are any questions that that people may have that they want to pose to our two speakers. Joey's got a question. <laughs> Does he? Do you have a question at the back there? Hi. Um, this question is for both Christoph and Aldi. Um, you're both in charge of a museum that is in the service, or particularly the um, Christoph, your institution, in the service of decorative art, functional art, historically, um, and of course, craft being a word that. Uh, all these institution has to deal with, which connotes function and decoration. But you also seem to want to focus and have an importance for contemporary art, which I agree with. Uh, contemporary artists offer more rigorous kind of intellectual investigation into things. It makes sense that you would want that as part of your mission. But on the effort of collecting, uh, how do you collect or what do you collect or who do you collect that um, you know, helps pay service to what the history of your institution does, but also recognizes contemporary artists who are doing the rigorous intellectual work. Yeah, the, this is a conversation that Joey and I have talked about a lot because I, I believe that, the, that our institution should collect and has a responsibility to collect in, our, in, in the city. And we have a, a small collection of, I don't know, 300 objects. Most of it is folk art. Um, there are some uh, design objects. We were just given a few pieces um, by Wendell Castle, who's an important American designer. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that uh, objects become reference points for both our, you know, artists and uh, for artists of all ilk. Um, so that we need to represent the, the best form or best ideas at, the, uh, at that moment. Uh, so whether it's a folk artist or a, a wood-turning bowl by uh, Rudy Solnik, uh, there are still reference points of creativity. And I think, I think that's something that, that 
in our city, this is a, a city with many, many museums, where there's, there's, there is one collecting, large collecting institution, and, and then there's us. And I think that that collection institution will be better because we're also making a, a, a very refined and important collection of, of objects and of objects, whether, it's, whether you want to call it fine art or craft or not. And can, can you say something briefly about the, the Max approach to collecting today? The Max approach to collecting is, to put it bluntly, that it is the most frustrating part of my job. And I can... Frustrating. And I can tell you why. Because there, there's magnificent art around, yeah? There's also a lot of bad art, but there's great art around, there's great design, great other applied art. And you have very limited possibilities to actually collect. It's true, we have a huge collection. But when you see things um, at art fairs, in galleries, at auctions, in auction catalogs, etc., you think this should really belong to the museum. And you know, you know exactly that in uh, most of the cases, um, it won't go to the museum. And it's, that's the frustrating part. Of course, we don't want to collect everything. Uh, but there is a huge amount of fantastic objects on offer. And in that sense, we are trying to collect. On the, on the one hand, we, of course, um, want donations. We have to be very smart to get the right donations, especially in the context also of large um, uh, exhibitions. Yeah? So that's always a very good mechanism. And I'm not talking necessarily about living artists and disabusing the artists. I'm talking about just the occasion um, to get things going. Yeah? We have uh, Josef Frank exhibition coming up, so this is a good mechanism to find uh, interesting me kind of uh, occasions, opportunities to, to, to enrich our Josef Frank collection. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we, have, we, we can buy a little bit, uh, but not enough. And so you have to be very succinct and precise uh, on how to choose the right pieces uh, to add to the collection. So, so you don't have a budget to actually to collect objects? Is that... No, we have, we have a budget, but it's a small budget. Uh, we have, uh, which sounds maybe a little bit paradox, uh, uh, due to a mechanism called uh, gallery promotion, we have uh, a larger budget for, budget for contemporary fine art than for the applied arts. But we get more donations in the applied arts. Right. Thank you. I, I think on that note, I'm probably going to have to pull this to a close. Um, unless it, are there any more questions? I, I, I might sort of have a question. Do you have a question? Well, I just I, um, are are there reference? I mean, are there reference other reference museums for you uh, in the world? That's that's. Uh, your size or is navigating this relationship uh, or, or, or blending the boundaries. Um, uh, and the reason I ask that is because I, when I took this job, I read this book, Thinking Through Craft, that, that Glenn Adamson wrote, and now he's the, the, the director at the Museum of Art and Design in New York, which you referenced. And I, I'm, he has only been there about a year, but I'm, I'm suspicious or I'm not, or I'm, I'm Wondering if he, if he's actually falling back into a, a a more defined world, like if his program is not actually as blending the boundaries between art and craft, uh, or art and applied arts, is as he as he uh, as he wrote in in his book. And I don't know if you if if you've been following the program, but it it, it it's something that I'm just wondering if you're aware of that or if you think of the, of their program. I would rather like to. Um reply to the first part of your mm -hmm. remark at question. Uh, we are the second oldest museum of applied arts in the world, after the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Of course, we follow and we have a very good relationship with the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, we would lo love to stage big fashion shows like Alexander McQueen. It's very difficult to do that in Vienna because we don't have the money required, and we probably don't have the audience in masses uh, required also to compensate for your investment. Yeah, but I'd love to do that. But um, I should say we are, in terms of quality, we're certainly we have less. Our collection is of course smaller, but we have the second largest collection, and we are 
uh, in terms of quality, I would say on a par with the Victorian Albert Museum, and we're certainly the second most important museum of applied arts in the world. That is our arrogance, yeah? But we are working hard uh, to kind of make you feel it's, uh, it's true. Well, I would say, that it, to your credit, you feel fresher than the Victoria and Albert Museum. Is, it, I, it might, I don't want to ask the question, I mean, I think there, there needs to be an evolution. If we're talking about blending, we're, there, there is an evolution in the field. Um, that's, in a sense... A There's a lot of evolution. And if you, uh, for instance, uh, last June, June we had uh, the first big meeting here at, uh, at the MAC of Applied Art Museums in the World, yeah? um, uh, proposed by the Victor and Albert, done together with us. Um, and it was great to see all those different approaches of, of Applied Art Museums uh, in the world. And I can tell you that uh, the V&A um, has big projects on the former Olympic grounds in London that will really deal with the future. So it's only a couple of years and then they will have a huge complex there. But in terms of substance, what we are doing, also in terms of dealing with digital modernity, I think we are very far advanced. Yeah? Which doesn't mean that we can't learn, so we are always eager to learn uh, from other museums, but also from especially artists, designers, architects and other creative people. Um, let me just throw the question a little bit back at you and, and ask you to talk a little bit about uh, the strategy. That you, obviously, you have a small collection at the moment, and you have ambitions to build a collection. And do you have a programmatic strategy for that building? And how does it, for instance, relate to uh, the sense of place where you are? Yeah, I mean, we do have a, a, a strategy for us local, the, the local and the national conversation is very important. We need to place Kentucky in, in some kind of context. Uh, that's how we can serve our public and serve our artists that we have, um, uh, you know, in the, in the region. So it's, it's very much uh, uh, both a knowledge of the regional art scene and then really uh, important moments in, in, uh, in the art world uh, uh, through either objects or um, conceptual works or whatnot. But, but, but we're 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 very clear about the the national references that we that we need to um, that we need to have into um, in our collection, and then in, we have no budget to buy to buy art at the moment. So we uh, 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 I, I, there is uh, in the U.S. I think more of a a climate for people to make donations. I think the hardest part for us is to not necessarily listen to our donors, but to encourage donors to think as we do and, and, and to search those important, those important objects. I'm, I'm a firm believer in each applied art museum and arts and crafts museum and design museum defining its very own special way. I don't think, I mean, when you have contemporary fine art museums, you know more or less the pattern, you know, how they work. I think it's completely different with applied art museums because there are all sorts of different constellations and I think each and every museum has really to develop on its own, learning from others, but it's not to be kind of uh, uh, identical to any other museum. I don't think it's possible in the field of the applied arts. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. The, um, one of the works that... Uh, uh, one of the artists that we're looking at is an, uh, an artist named Edgar Tolson, who was a, a folk artist that was in the Whitney Biennial in the 80s, and, um, uh, sorry, 1973. And, uh, you know, he, he was brought into this incredible platform of the international art, art world, and, um, but completely missed by, by, by both the Speed Museum and, um, uh, and, and, our, and our museum. So it, it, it was... Uh, I think there are moments like that that we really need to think about, and that's something that we can offer our, our public. It's a Kentucky artist, uh, 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 again, on, on an international or national platform. Um, I will close at this point um, and, and just say that... Drink. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting that two museums, that obviously we know the differences of them from scale and uh, history... Uh, it's inter I think it's very interesting what Christoph was saying about every institution within uh, the uh, decorative arts and the crafts 
really has to kind of find a model of its own, um, that, that these contributions that each museum make actually constitute a, a wonderful constellation of possibilities that are very different from what seems to be a kind of homogenized sense of how a fine art museum operates, um, perhaps creates a greater field of possibilities. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to thank you both for uh, your contributions and, and uh, for uh, giving us insights into the challenges that you face. Um, and I'd like to thank our audience for coming and also again to remind you that there is a tour leaving from here um, after this talk. Okay, thank you. <laughs>